Um, well, tonight we're going to be talking about composite materials. Uh, composites have been around for a long time. Uh, they've been in the news a lot in Seattle recently due to a certain airplane. Um, and that's actually a really exciting development. And I'll actually address some of those things that are going on with those and where we see uh, composites going in the future. So it's a quick overview, you know, introduction about materials and why at least I think they're important. Uh, the different types of materials, some of their properties, and then really start talking about composites, um, what's good about them, what do we need to learn more about them, and then where might we be able to take them. And I didn't know Nova had the uh, same, well not the same four words, but four words there, but what I try to do is make them stronger, stiffer, smarter and safer for applications in aerospace and automobiles and things like that. So why do we need, why do we need new materials? Okay. Um, well, if you look at uh, history of man, it was the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, uh, the Iron Age, and then uh, he went into the graduate. Let's see if this actually works or not. Where's my... I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir. You. Plastics. <laughs> so, as a material scientist, that's one of my favorite movie <laughs> clips. <laughs> and you can see the polymer age or plastics really started there and was taking off in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Since then, you know, the, the number of materials has just expanded tremendously in the last 50 years. And now people will say the silicon age, the information age, who knows where we are next. Um, but all of the uh, technology is really limited by what materials we have available to make our tools or our airplanes or our cars or our space bridges in the future maybe. So our space elevators. So Classically, we've looked at things like metals, ceramics, polymers, or plastics, and some typical applications of them. And yet, there's many things made out of the same thing. Uh, okay, a container to hold a beverage. They make them out of metal, glass, and plastic. Um, why do they make them all of all those different things when it's all doing the same thing? So it just shows there's a many choices there, and whether it's due to a th aesthetics, uh, maybe you think it tastes better, maybe it's cheaper. All those things go into choosing the right material. And so if you look at the different types of materials <coughs> in terms of metals, um, they're fairly strong. They're what we call ductile. They usually bend before they break, which is a good thing in many applications. Uh, they're good thermal and electrical conductors, you know, our wires and things like that. Um, they're opaque, and generally they have that metallic look to them. They're shiny. <laughs> um, polymers, uh, there's a wide variety of polymers, both natural polymers like our skin and our hair, to the man-made polymers, you know, our milk jugs and things like that. Um, you know, a little bit of the, the type of bonding that takes place in them is mostly a covalent bonding where they actually share electrons, and this gives them certain properties. Um, Many polymers are soft compared to metals and ceramics. Um, they have a low density, which means they're lightweight, which is good. Um, they're generally insulators, and they have a wide variety of optical properties, again, due to their atomic arrangements and things like that. <coughs> ceramics, on the other hand, are usually ionic, or they also can have covalent bonding. Uh, they are generally very hard and very brittle. Things like our beer glasses or the diamonds in our rings are all examples of ceramics. Um, most of them are insulators. Diamond is kind of a funny <laughs> exception to that rule. And then we come down to composites. Well, they're not one of those three. They're generally a mix. Okay, so a composite is when you take two different materials, mix them together to make a new material, 
And now this new material isn't just an atomic mix of a material like an alloy or a solution. You actually have two distinct phases or two or more distinct phases that retain some of the properties of what you mix together. So it's a little bit different than just you know, mixing you know, alcohol and water together or <laughs> things like that to get a mixture. Um, <coughs> so with composites, the objective is really to try to take the best properties from two different materials, put them together, and use what's called the principle of combined action to get sort of an average of the properties, which is not available in either one of the materials by themselves. And so mostly I'll be talking about what are called polymer matrix composites tonight. So we'll take a polymer and then we'll reinforce that polymer with a ceramic or another polymer in some cases. And so you can get sort of the flexibility and the weight, lightweight of a polymer, plus the strength and the stiffness of a ceramic in a new material. And the nice thing about composites is that you can sort of engineer your material by the choice of what you're putting together and how much polymer and how much ceramic you put together. The orientation of the ceramic within the polymer as well. So there's a lot of flexibility there to come up with sort of um, designed material properties. So just looking at strength of the different materials we've talked about. Um, as we said, metals are fairly strong and it depends whether we're talking about steel or gold. Um, ceramics, there's a variety there. The technical ceramics are fairly strong. Polymers are down here in the strength. And composites go over a very wide range because it's what you're mixing together. Um, you know, wood is actually a composite. It's a composite made out of two or more different types of polymers, actually. So down here, it's actually, you know, a mix of polymers. Some of these is CFRC is carbon fiber reinforced composites. GFRC would be glass fiber reinforced composites. And so you can talk about the different reinforcements you use. And you can see, well, okay, composites are maybe as about as strong as steel, but generally you hear that composites are actually stronger than steel, right? Well, it depends on how you uh, measure that strength. Because if we look at weight, you can see here the density, and this is a log scale, so this is actually, it's 10 times from here to here. Metals are all quite heavy. Uh, ceramics, a little less dense. Polymers are very light, and composites are down there if you use the right mixture of composites. And you know, here we actually are lower than polymers, and that's because you may have things like porosity in your composites. You have little bubbles that actually make it a less dense material. But if you think about a lot of the applications, um, especially like aerospace and actually transportation, what's very important isn't just strength or just weight, it's the combination. You want something that is strong and light. So if you look at composites, you know, on the base of just strength and stiffness, there's not a clear advantage. But if you look at it in terms of weight, there's a huge advantage. So if you say, well, how much force will one pound of composite hold compared to one pound of steel, then you can really get a better measure when weight is an important property. So we look at these that we call specific properties where we take the stiffness or the modulus and divide it by the density, or the strength, and you divide that by the density. And here's a sort of quick example showing that. Um, here's just a schematic, say, of one cubic inch of steel and one cubic inch of composite, so it'd be one inch by one inch by one inch. And you look at the densities of those. This is a high-strength steel. This is a high-strength composite. You know, very high density for the steel. We look at the strengths there. But now if you divide the strength by the density, you get the specific strength. And here you see steel is about 22, composites about 100. So composites in that case would be five times stronger than steel on a weight basis. 
So that's where, we, you know, there's this great incentive to use composites in things like aerospace and transportation where weight is a penalty. So why do composites have this property? Well, I've passed around some uh, different composites and some of the raw materials that go into composites. And tonight I'm talking about fiber reinforced composites. So there's some fabric looking samples going around. Uh, there's a white one that is a glass fiber weave. There's a black one, which is a carbon fiber or graphite fiber weave. And then there's a red and white one, which is the red fibers are actually Kevlar. So same thing as using some of the bulletproof vests. And the white fibers are uh, the glass fibers again. So you can design just the fabric you're using as well to have certain properties by mixing two different fiber types together. But you can see the fibers by themselves, you know, they're very flexible. Um, if you pull, along, pull them in the direction of the fibers, you'll see that they're very strong. But if you're off axis a little bit or push it together, you'll see it folds. There's nothing holding those fibers in place. So it's sort of like a rope. Try to push something with a rope, it doesn't work very well. So in a composite, you need something called the matrix. And that's what comes and surrounds all the fibers and actually helps transfer the stress between the fibers. I didn't have a lot of samples of the matrix, but um, here is one that I have and I can pass it around here. This is just the material that the plastic that goes around the fibers in a, this is a sample of epoxy. Same thing you would get in the five minute epoxy tube you squeeze out, but a little bit higher tech, higher properties for aerospace grade resin. And you would put this around the fibers and then after it cures and sets up and becomes hard, you see the results of that. And the other samples I'm passing around, which are now very stiff, strong and lightweight. So I can go ahead and pass that around if you want. Um, I also put in a sample of just metal so you can sort of feel the weight difference between the composite and the metal. And also there's a sample of what's called a honeycomb composite um, where they've taken aluminum and it looks just like a honeycomb in a beehive uh, and then bonded on two thin layers of composite on the outside. And you can see that is very strong and very stiff. And that's very uh, representative of what you're walking on when you're in an airplane. The floors of airplanes and a lot of luggage compartments, you know, they're thick, but they're very lightweight because they're made out of these honeycomb structures. So what is it that gives them the, the strength? It's the fibers. You, those fibers are very high strength and stiffness. They're carbon or glass or Kevlar, which is a very uh, specific polymer compound. Um, they have very small diameters. The fibers here shown in the electron microscope, um, the bar here from here to here is 50 microns, which is about the radius of your hair. Your hair is 75 to 100 microns in diameter. So you can see these fibers here are generally in the order of seven to 10 microns. So it's, you, barely even see one of them with your eye, if at all. And the smaller you make something, the stronger it is. Um, and the reason for that is strength is usually limited by defects. So cracks or chips or scratches. So an example of a chain, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link, okay? So the more links you have, the greater the probability there is of a weaker link. So the longer the chain, the weaker it is. So using that principle in reverse, the smaller you make these fibers in terms of the diameter, the stronger they will actually be. So having these very fine fibers actually gives the high strength to the composites. So composites have a lot of advantages. The strength to weight, uh, they don't usually corrode. They have what's called fatigue properties. That's if you bend something back and forth, does it break? and we can design them. Um, there's one sample going around there, the thin black sample. If you bend it one way, it bends fairly easily. You bend it the other direction, it's very stiff. And that's because the carbon fibers are all running in one direction. So in that direction, it's really stiff and strong. You bend it the other way, you actually can snap it very easily with your hand. It's 
not a big problem if you do. So you can actually use that when you have an application, say a, an airplane wing, where the loads aren't the same in all directions. You can put more fibers in one direction than the other, and that will make it stronger in that direction and save weight because you haven't put extra material in the other direction. So, you know, 787 is a classic example these days. And for commercial aircraft, it's uh, really pretty revolutionary. Um, the size of making something out of composites is, is amazing that they've done. And um, this is sort of showing the use of composite. And this is how much composite there is by weight, about 50%. And if you look at that per volume instead, it's going to be about 80% composite because the other components are so heavy, the titanium and the steel. And they make it in this modular uh, way and put it all together. And here's some other pictures showing how they actually make the nose in one piece and the fuselage in a couple different pieces. And this is that same black carbon fiber we've been passing around. And they put that together and cure it and come up with some really strong, lightweight structures. And um, here's a picture from the testing of one of the aircraft. And they're seeing how strong the wings are. And a little hard to see. Here's the aircraft. Here are the wings. All this is the huge machine they had to build around it to make, to apply that much load. And the wings are normally right about here. You can see the wing is now bent up here 25 feet. <laughs> and when they let go, it went right back to where it started. So it was totally what we call elastic deformation. So they actually ran out of room here. The machine couldn't go up anymore. They, couldn't, they could have gone further, but the machine <laughs> didn't have to, and they've exceeded what they needed to for their load testing. So there's actually a YouTube video on this. It's hard to see it down here. You can actually watch it go up, 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 and it's just amazing. Um, the other applications, you know, is automobiles. And um, Lamborghini has been a leader in this. You know, they make some really nice sports cars. And uh, they've come up with a new demonstrator called the, uh, I guess, Siesto Elemento. I'm not very good at Italian, but this is a mostly carbon fiber car. And they've done a lot in reducing the weight. Um, so based on the previous version, it was about 3,400 pounds. Uh, and they dropped it down to 2,100, 2,200 pounds. I mean, zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know the gas mileage. But <laughs> it's actually, you know, not just the outside of the, com the car made out of composite. You're looking inside of it, the, the whole frame is made out of composites. Many of the exhaust manifolds are out of composites. I think the wheels are made out of composite. So there's very little, you know, maybe, I'm not sure if this part of the brake is metal, maybe. <laughs> and the engine, uh, I mean, the drive shaft is composite. So they've really, you know, looked at all these different applications. And actually at the University of Washington, and there's actually, we have a lab there called Automobile Lamborghini. Um, they l used to use this part made out of aluminum, and now they've made it out of carbon fiber composite, redesigned it, you know, 30% weight loss is actually, it's quicker to make, and they were able to reduce the cost, which is actually kind of unique, because usually composites are more expensive. Um, so we, there's manufacturing methods now coming into place that actually can make composites less expensive than metals. So, yeah, composites are great. <laughs> so why am I still doing research in them? Um, well, there are still some really uh, significant challenges out there. And one of them is uh, quality insurance, inspection. And if you're bonding composites together, uh, does your glue stick? Um, if somebody runs into the composite, how do you fix it? Okay, so those are uh, significant challenges. Um, how do you make these complex structures? Um, you really don't like to drill holes in your composite because the strength comes from the fibers. If you drill a hole, you're now breaking those fibers and you're not getting the load transfer anymore. So it's 
really advantageous to either bond them or glue them together or try to make as much of it you can in one piece. And then, you know, how do you know if uh, there is damage? They spring back. So you can't tell what happened underneath them. And so um, we're working on what's called, you know, smart composites. Can these composites actually tell you what has happened to them? And so looking at bonding versus bolting, um, you know, if you're going to bond it or rivet it like you do with a metal airplane, you have to drill holes in it. That doesn't work very well in composites. I mean, you can do it, but you're adding metal now for the bolts. That's adding weight. You're putting holes in there. Um, so if you really can glue them together, it's much better. Uh, the question is, how much do you trust your glue? <laughs> and um, one of the things I study is, well, how do you know if your glue will stick? And that requires inspection of the surface to make sure you've properly prepared the surface ahead of time. You need to have a very clean surface without contaminants and things like that. And doing that, you know, in a factory can be a challenge. And, you know, can you inspect it to make sure it is clean? So we look at the different bonding mechanisms, whether it's a chemical bond. So here's sort of a, a magnified view of what would be sort of the composite surface, and the red would be the glue that goes in and fills in all these little microvoids you really can't see by eye. And um, how do you do this? So that's one of my areas of research. Uh, another area is, well, how can we make composites so we don't have to glue them together? Um, can you come up with new ideas to manufacture them and make them into the shapes you need? Um, I do a lot of work with local companies. One of them is called Envision. And they've come up with an idea of how you can actually uh, make these what we call integrally stiffened composite parts. Um, so it has the structure built into it. And so sort of an example of what was impossible to build previously in composites looking at your aircraft door and the way they make them right now is with all these different pieces of metal or sometimes composites and they're sealed and they're bolted and you're know, looking at a cross section through here it's a pretty complex structure well what if you can just make that in one piece like this out of composite and just making an i-beam is pretty easy but if you're actually trying to do this inside here with we call skins on both sides. It's really hard to get the composite to consolidate together properly. So there's this new manufacturing method where we can actually start with these plastic bottles, we call them, but they're actually very precision bottles. Um, you can wrap your composite around them, put them into a mold, and then you almost sort of blow up the bottle. And this presses the composites together from the inside. Uh, traditional methods, they use presses and things like that and squeeze them together. Um, so having these uh, precise bottles inside, um, then you actually can break out the bottles after you're done, can make these composite parts. And here we've cut one open to show the structure you can make inside this, um, what we call a tool, using this method. And looking at that, that's sort of a test article, you know, we really want to make something like this. So here is a, what we call a wing box. And you know the current way is these metal parts that are all bolted and bonded together and many, many different uh, components there. Well, if you can take that, design that and out of making into a carbon fiber piece, and then we actually were able to produce one of those all in one shot using this uh, new technology. So we didn't have to do any bonding or bolting or anything like that. And it came out to be actually lighter than the part and actually cheaper because the time it takes to drill all the holes and fasten them and inspect them and do all that, if you can make it all in one shot, it actually can reduce the cost. So now moving on to sort of a little more futuristic thoughts. Um, the other area is, well, you know, what can, can we make a smart composite? So uh, I use the analogy of a mood ring, okay? So what if your car had a mood ring? It's going to tell you it's not feeling well. Or, you know, it's got the check engine light right now, but, you know, what if we can take it further than that? You know, hey, I'm rusting in the back corner or something like that. 
and well, some of them get <laughs> two colors, but we want to try to make what we call a smart composite. And one of the ways we want to do this is not put wires and sensors and things like that into the composite, because that's just adding weight and complexity. What we want to do is actually do what's called molecular engineering. So you actually design your molecules that you can add into the composite that can tell you things about what's going on there. How hot it is, uh, how much stress it's under, has it been damaged, has it been hit by lightning, things like this. So these molecules would give out a different signal once they've been exposed to something. The trick is to get that to mix into this resin and be uniformly distributed throughout the composite. Um, so we're working on this, and so we use what are called molecular sensors. We design these molecules, so in this case, we're looking at a stress-sensitive material. Um, when these two molecules are together, they might be on, which would give one color, and then when you actually pull them apart, they separate, and you can get a different signal out of them. In this case, it's a fluorescence. So it's like you're glowing the dark posters and things like that. Okay, well, we're getting the composites to glow according to how much stress they're in. And starting off here, it was yellow, and as we pulled on it, we actually were able to get it to change color. So this would be, it could be used to um, inspect for damage. So if, you know, somebody bumped into your car, or more seriously, somebody put the, uh, baggage truck into the side of your airplane <laughs> and it popped back out and pilot can't see it but the guy with the special light can see it and say oh look we better take a look at this so that's what one of the, the futuristic things I'm looking at uh, working with so the big advantage of this would be one is the safety but also because they're hard to inspect, we really have a large safety factor with composites. They're over-designed, so they're heavier and stronger than they really need to be. So if we can understand them better by having these molecular sensors, we really can push composites even further um, to understand the effect of aging, environment, damage, how good a repair, and having this composite that can talk back to us really would help a lot. And of course, all you know, a lot of things start here in the high dollar world, but look at the number of composites that are out there now using wind energy, automobiles, sporting goods, medical applications. Um, so the composites really do tend to filter down into the proper applications. And so with that, just to wrap up with that, you know, I'm trying to make them stronger, stiffer, smarter, and safer, and starting off with <laughs> <laughs> with Leonardo's ideas to today's ideas and, you know, hopefully in the future, even better ideas. So, thank you very much. All right. Now, the Boeing company is putting these composites together into a huge fuselage, but you say they're making them in modules. All right. Since glue is the problem, how are they putting those modules together? And secondly, is that safe? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, they do make them in modules. They have designed them so, I don't know all the exact design details, um, but there they, are, they do use uh, fasteners, bolts, and rivets to actually hold the sections together in addition to bonding them. So there's a redundant thing there and I think it's safe and <laughs> I'll, I'll try it. Hi, this is a, a very basic materials question mm -hmm. but as someone who's not in the field at all and didn't study it I find that I have a very limited mental model of what a ceramic is and I wouldn't have thought of glass as a ceramic so I'm wondering if you could kind of explain what the technical definition is of a ceramic. Okay. Uh, there are several different, you know, versions of and definitions of a ceramic. Um, so, uh, a ceramic is generally a covalently bonded or ionically bonded material. Um, often, it, it's if you look at the periodic table, you can sort of divide it into metals and nonmetals. So, a, a ceramic is generally a metal combined with a non-metal, 
to make uh, a compound. So like glass is uh, silicon dioxide. Silicon with two oxygens bonded to it. So silicon is sort of a metal <laughs> and the oxygen is definitely a non-metal. So that's an example of, of a ceramic. You also, you know, like aluminum oxide is a ceramic. There are also ceramics that are put together uh, that are, have more covalent type bonds. So if you have silicon and carbon, it can bond together and make silicon carbide. And silicon and nitrogen can bond together and make silicon nitride. And you can have many different mixes like oxynitrides and things like that combined with them. So generally it's a, a metal combined with a non-metal with um, either a sharing or exchange of electrons. I guess would be a... <laughs> Two quick I questions. Uh, is there such a thing as pre-stressed composites, somewhat like uh, pre-stressed concrete? Mm -hmm. uh, and second, uh, since most of the composites are essentially woven cloth layered on top of each other, uh, is there any, any work to potentially make it like a, three direct, a 3D ply? Mm -hmm. So uh, the first question was pre-stressed. Um, Yes, uh, oftentimes it's not intentional though. <laughs> um, Pre-stress is also another, we call them residual stresses. Um, so a lot of composites are uh, processed at higher temperatures in order to get the polymer to um, react and form a, a strong uh, polymer. And so then when you cool it down, things shrink differently and so you actually can get these residual stresses which can cause your composites to warp and go to shapes you don't want them to. Um, I'm trying to think of, advan of uh, cases where this is done intentionally like it is in pre-stressed concrete to actually increase the strength of the material. And rigidity. Uh, and rigidity. Um, in terms of the rigidity, it's would most, I, I wouldn't see much advantage because yeah, the rigidity is due to the fibers and they're fairly linear. Um, but in terms of increasing the strength, so you could actually get compressive stresses in certain areas so cracks don't grow. Um, I don't know of any applications off the top of my head, but I know sometimes they you know, use composites in concrete and actually pre-stress composite instead of steel to do it. Um, there are some examples in like Corelware, which is uh, the unbreakable ceramic plates. There they basically pre-stress it by putting the surface in compression and the inside in tension, again by using the thermal expansion mismatch. I haven't seen too many where they actually pull on them physically and let them go though. Um, the second question was regarding the, sort of the geometry of the reinforcements and uh, the majority of them are uh, you know, sort of layered in one plane, basically. And uh, so in the cases where you have, you know, like a hoop stress or something like that and a fuselage, that's great. There is new technology coming out what's called braiding. So they actually do, uh, instead of just having layers stacked on top of each other, they actually braid the fibers into 3D structures and other times they will actually take layers of these fabric and then go through and stitch them with almost like a sewing machine. So you do get fibers going in this direction as well. So that'll help increase the strength because if there aren't any fibers in that direction, it won't be strong. So you know, some of the parts going around, it was not as strong in one direction and they actually snapped, which is fine. Um, so to combat that, they'll put fibers, you know, across that direction. But now if you try to pull it apart, how do you get fibers going this way. So it's, a, it's looking at trying to make 3D composites is a new area. Yes. Thank you. I'm used to used to motorcycle fairings where they, for putting mount points for the fairings, you, mm -hmm. you actually either wrap the fiberglass around it 
uh, and typically put some kind of like a, an aluminum backing plate or something there. Um, for bonding the carbon fiber and stuff, I is there a way for the bonding methods, do you actually ever split the fibers, like not break a fiber, but put something between the fibers and make your hole there? Or is it wrapped around? Like, do you actually just drill them, which loses the strength, or do you wrap them and then bond them, af you know, glue them after you've made your shape with the hole in it? Um, so y for putting, yeah, holes or inserts into composites, it's best if you can actually, yeah, wrap the fiber around it like that. But in many cases, it's too complex of a part. And in a manufacturing environment, they will actually just go through and drill it out. And that's sort of what, you know, they have to do. And they sometimes will put an insert into the hole to help stop or you know, to redistribute the stress better. But that's what they do. Um, that's why when bonding, you actually don't drill any holes. You would, you know, overlay them and put a layer of adhesive between them and then apply the stress in this direction instead of actually, you know, putting holes and rivets in there. Um, with the use of composites, you're obviously saving materials um, just from the get-go, but is recycling something that's that's thought of at this early in the development of composites? Do you think about how, what you do when you're done with these materials once they've, they've reached their end of life? That's a very good question. And there's a lot of thought going into it. Um, it depends somewhat on what type of matrix you use. Um, plastics can generally divide it into two main categories. One's what's called a thermoset plastic, like epoxies, uh, you heat them up and they won't melt, whereas uh, m many others are called thermoplastic uh, polymers, such as the recycling you put out in your curbside, where those can be melted and they'll actually go back in sort of a liquid form and can be reused. Um, so if you put one of those types of polymers around your fibers, then you can reheat it and tentatively uh, recycle it. Um, with the thermoset, the typical epoxies and things like that, it's more of a challenge because these polymers are now permanently set in that geometry. So there is a lot of work going on in trying to see, well, can we maybe recover the carbon fibers and give up the epoxy matrix? Because even making the carbon fibers is very energy and resource intensive and they're very expensive. Um, if you could recycle the fibers, maybe you wouldn't use them in an airplane, but maybe you would in a laptop case. Um, I think a few years ago, uh, high up at Boeing actually said, well, we'll just grind them up and put them in parking lots. But <laughs> that didn't go over very well. So it's, you know, when you're looking at, you know, 50 to $100 a pound material, you want to find a way to keep the value in it. So there is actually research going on in, in how you can perhaps recycle these and at least get the fibers out or is there a way to reuse them in, you know, other less demanding applications? Uh, in your example of the baggage cart hitting the 787, uh, if there had been enough damage that that section of the fuselage needed to be replaced, uh, what happens then? Obviously you don't scrap the whole plane because the section has been destroyed. Uh, what kind of repair processes can be done on something like that? Um, it depends, you know, on the size and the location of the damage and what is sort of behind the fuselage there, what type of actual structure is there. Um, they have been developing and they actually said, you know, they design for repairability. That's one of the key things, because you don't want to scrap a huge aircraft because that happens. Um, so right now, the most conservative uh, repair is actually what they call a bolted repair. So they can actually reform similar parts uh, of what was damaged behind there and bolt those onto the damaged parts. And they'd be like called doublers or things like that. And it would obviously increase the weight of that section, but it would restore the load carrying capacity. And once you do that, you know, re reinforcing the, the main structure underneath, 
um, fixing the skin is not as hard. That's more of a, a thinner layer and we, you can actually grind out the damaged composite and you can get the fabric like that and put the glue in almost like you would repair a sailboat or a kayak or something like that, a little bit higher um, technology is used to do it and build that back up and you wouldn't really be able to tell from the outside and it would restore the structural integrity to the aircraft. And so they're using, sometimes they'll do all composites, sometimes they're using titanium and other um, advanced structural materials to repair what's needed on the inside. I recently uh, saw a talk by a couple of spacecraft historians who had been looking at the lunar landers and, and one of the things that really impressed them of, of those craft from 40 years ago is how flimsy they were. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about the future of, of uh, composites as it apply to spacecraft, particularly if there's any sort of potential for solving some of the human space flight challenges like dealing with radiation in outer space. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of composites being used um, in spacecraft now. Uh, there's different environmental things you have to worry about, such as the amount of space radiation and things that are sort of filtered out by uh, the Earth's environment. Um, but uh, in terms of you know the weight savings, they are uh, fairly widely used, and so I think there you know there's. A lot of good applications there for composites in space as well. Hi, my dentist uses these light cured composite fillings in my teeth. Is that the same thing that you're talking about? Well, again, a composite is a you know very generic term of a mixture of two materials put together. I mean, concrete is actually a uh, composite because you take rock and you take cement and you mix it together and now you have a composite. Um, the compo dental composites are not too far away uh, except they're not using continuous fibers. So they have a polymer resin and then they have what are called, they have particles in there. So I'm not sure if they're ceramic particles or other polymer particles mixed together with something that will bond it together. and they put it into your teeth and shine the light on it and that light causes a reaction to take place in the sort of glue that's holding all the particles together and causes it to firm up and become hard. So it's similar, yes. Do we have any questions in the back room? So I was interested in what you were saying about how the um, was it the Lamborghini that was had a lot of its some of its engine parts made out of the composites? So how would some of those polymer composites react under higher temperatures? Do do they stay as strong? How do they compare to more traditional metallic components at high temperature? The use temperature of polymers is generally lower than that of metals. So. You know, the actual engine itself of the Lamborghini is made out of metal. But they do have, you know, many parts that were traditionally made out of metal, some of the exhaust and maybe some of the valve covers and things like that made out of composites. And it depends on what polymer you use to make them out of. And there's been um, a fair amount of advancement in getting higher temperature capabilities out of polymers. So if they can use um, the, the polymer matrices, and many of them have what are called aramid rings, sort of those uh, six-sided carbon things if you ever saw <laughs> in chemistry, the more of those you can put into the, the molecules, generally the higher the use temperature of the polymer will be. So if you can increase the strength of the bonding between the polymer molecules, you can increase their use temperature. And so they are getting use temperatures, I'm thinking four or five hundred degrees now. So pretty significant. And so they do things, you know, perhaps they'll have 
some metal on the inside and then have polymer on the outside. And then as the temperature drops, say, in the exhaust, they can go to all uh, composite. So there, is some, there are definitely limitations. Um, there are also uh, classes of composites that don't use plastics for the matrix. They actually can use a ceramic or a metal for the matrix. So there are metal matrix composites out there and there are ceramic matrix composites. And in some aircraft, they actually use these ceramic matrix composites where they have a ceramic matrix and ceramic fibers and they are actually used at higher temperatures than the metals can withstand. So in metal aircraft, uh, metal fatigue is one of the things that determines ultimately the useful life of an aircraft. In a composite plane, short of the engine failing, what's going to define the, ultimately the useful life of a composite air structure, aircraft structure? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of a commercial aircraft, uh, you know, they're not really sure yet. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, they have some, they're postulating. I think it may just be they're going to be designing better aircraft by then with better aerodynamics or, you know, better composites in it. So they may just become just obsolete. Um, the, um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, what, what's the Achilles heel of composites that would lead f to it? Uh, to degradation, um, but they've been, you know, doing some uh, test articles that have been flying for 20, 25 years, and they've taken them apart and looked at them, and they still look good. So um, I'm not sure what's actually going to cause the composite aircraft. You know, I think it's probably going to be that they've designed better ones. You know, after 40 years in service, it's going to be time to be a better design. the most in uh, composites these days uh, in terms of government agencies or uh, companies maybe besides Boeing? Again, you know, composites is a huge uh, area in many different types. Um, I mean, aerospace is one, but wind energy is becoming uh, very large. Um, I mean, composite boats have been around for quite some time. So, uh, you know, it depends how you want to measure it. In terms of dollars, you know, <coughs> aircraft still is a very high-priced, high-end use of composites. But you're looking at, you know, sporting industries are really starting to use them now. Um, wind energy, medical, looking at trying to get other transportations, getting them into automobiles. We, you know, to really go to an electric car, one of the big things will be is to reduce the weight. So if we can make a composite car that weighs half as much, you'll be able to go that much further on your battery. So I, I really don't have data to say who's the biggest investing uh, right now. I mean, the, the government definitely is. Uh, you know, they always ha military's always been big in composites, but the consumer use of composites has also taken off, and so I don't have a good idea on the dollar figure. It's pretty widespread. In the marine industry, they've been going to the direction of, uh, as opposed to solid composite material, FRP, to uh, foam core or balsa core materials. Is that also the direction they're going in aerospace? In, in some cases, um, they do a lot of honeycomb structure there in, instead. Um, so they do a lot with you know, aluminum honeycomb and Nomex honeycomb. But the durability of a solid laminate is usually better than that of a honeycomb. A honeycomb has a lot of empty space there and you can get moisture ingression and then you get freeze thaw problems and things like that. So, you know, the fuselage of these aircraft are pretty much solid uh, composite laminates. Uh, the wing skins are fairly solid, but there is work on, you know, coming up with better core structures. So instead of it's aluminum or it's called Nomax, which is some sort of a high temperature paper, can they make a carbon fiber honeycomb now that actually is more of a structural honeycomb and has better properties? 
So it's an area of investigation, but in terms of damage tolerance and things like that, a solid laminate is much more robust. There's a question about uh, the ductility or the deformation that occurs in composites affecting the drag. Um, I'm not an aerospace guy in terms of uh, you know looking at the drag coefficients and things like that, but I think the fact that the wings are more flexible actually have let them design the wing differently so that there's less drag uh, because it can be either narrower or something like that. And I think they do do a lot of modeling and actually, you know, they measure for a certain force how much will the wing deflect and things like that. So I think that's fairly well known to the aerospace designers and um, the composites actually can be designed stiffer than metal. Hi. Um, I was really uh, interested when you uh, mentioned that uh, trees uh, were composite materials. Um, I know uh, it's more of a biotech question, but are there people interested in growing composite materials? Yes. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that are actually composites. Your teeth are a composite. Your bones are actually somewhat of a composite. Seashells are composites. Antlers are composites. So there is a whole field uh, I've known as biomimetics and trying to mimic biology. And, you know, seashells are amazing. They're creating these ceramics at room temperature in seawater with, you know, some proteins. And is there a way that, you know, we can understand that and use that to create um, composites or both either to, you know, regrow teeth or regrow bone or can we understand it and actually grow um, technological materials um, using what nature does? Somehow, you know, these, it's called, sometimes called templating. Somehow these organic proteins arrange themselves so that atoms like to sit there and they grow crystals and grow shapes. And um, trying to understand that is uh, definitely an area of interest and it's you know, probably not something we'll see in the next two or three years, uh, but down the road, um, trying to grow composites, um, artificial composites is definitely an area of research. <laughs>